welcome everybody. Glad to have you joining us online or here in the auditorium today. If I haven't met you, my name is Josh, and uh, we want to welcome you to Evangel. I'm one of the pastors here, and we are uh, in a series called Simple Gospel. And uh, today, I'm going to talk specifically about how the simple gospel is a gospel both for the sinner and the saint. So if you're the sinner in the room, will you just raise your hand? Just kidding, don't do that. All of us, right? We've all fallen short. But uh, I, I, if you have a Bible today, I'm going to read out of Romans. Don't bother opening to it. It's only one verse. I'm going to beat you to the punch. But uh, here we go. Romans 1.16 says this, For I am not ashamed of this good news about Christ, good news or gospel about Christ. It is the power of God at work, saving everyone who believes the Jew first and also the Gentile. Aren't you thankful today that it's the power of God at work? Not just the power of God from back then or the power of God at work over there, but it is the power of God at work for everyone who believes, for each person that believes. And the point I want to make today is that the simple gospel reaches across maybe all the, the confines and spaces and categories and people groups that exist in the world today. It's not just confined to one group of people or to just you and I, but it is, it is an open invitation to every nationality, race, gender, personality, class, social status, individual history, no matter what you've walked through, this invitation is for you. It's the thing that we as humans all have in common is that God has given an invitation for you and I to have a relationship with him again through his son, Jesus Christ. And I want to make the point today that it's not through a list of behaviors that you and I follow, but it is through the transformation of our heart. Come on, some of you followed the behaviors for a long time. You acted the part, you took the classes, you did the religion thing, and then you realized it was actually about your heart. It was actually about a relationship with Jesus. So let me just give you context today to this gospel. If you're wondering what gospel is, it's the good news about Christ. It is the power of God at work through Christ in us. So who's the sinner? And for the context of this message today... Uh, the sinner would be the person that disqualifies themselves from the gospel because of what they've done. It's the, it's the tendency to say, I've done too many things wrong. I've, I, I've missed the mark too many times. I've been stuck in this sin for too long. God doesn't want to use me anymore. What I've found in my life is even when I feel the most disqualified, God uses me in spite of myself to show that it's still about him and not about me. It's a... It's a the sinner is those that have maybe never had a chance or taken the opportunity to be encountered by the gospel. Then who's the, the saint? The saint is maybe the people that would seem or the people that would feel overqualified because of maybe what they know or what they've done. Maybe they understand the word very, very well. One of the most mind-boggling things to me in uh, going on a reach trip was being on the south side of Chicago where people were addicted to drugs and living in, in ways that were so contrary to scripture, but they could quote it at me. And I thought, wow, you can truly have a lot of knowledge, yet not have a heart transforming experience. And, and that, that's the difference today between somebody who uh, acts like a saint or, or maybe is celebrated as a saint, or people would say, wow, they're the most giving, generous person. They help so many people by what they do, but come on, if Christ isn't at the center, and if the transformation of your heart by Christ is not at the center, then it's not saintly. It's just good deeds. It's just good things. And they're great on this earth, but they won't go through into eternity with you. And you and I lay up a treasure in heaven that does not uh, rust or decay or become destroyed, so we live beyond just what happens in this world, and, and beyond what maybe people how they see us in this life. So here's the question. What is it about this gospel or this good news of Jesus that allows it to reach across all conditions of spirituality? From the very worst person that you and I can think of, the people that we would put in the category of Osama bin Laden and Hitler and, and those types of people, the gospel is for them as well. It's quiet in this Christian church. Maybe to the way other side of the spectrum, the person that does a lot of good deeds, helps a lot of people, maybe lives very saintly but doesn't have a relationship with Jesus, and the gospel impacts both groups of people. And I want to show you some stories back-to-back -back in Scripture today 
where Jesus encountered people like these in a one-on-one basis or one-on-one interaction and showed that the gospel isn't just uh, confined to one group of people or to one personality type or to one group of people that maybe is outside of people that you would normally associate with. It was just a few months ago that Janae and I went on a vacation. Uh, We took Avery along with us, and we got a free stay for a few nights at a really nice hotel. And we were were really excited about this nice hotel. It had just opened uh, this spring, and uh, we were excited that we got to stay there all the more because it was free. And you know what the problem is with those really nice hotels? No continental breakfast. (laughs) You go down for breakfast and it's $18 a plate. You're like, I better get to take the plate home as well, you know? (laughs) Anyway, so we we got this opportunity to stay at this nice hotel, nicer than what we normally would have stayed in. And we were driving to Minneapolis and we always stop in Fargo with family and make it a two-day trip. And so we'd been living out of our Ford Escape with a a one-and-a-half-year-old who is wild and crazy and messy in the back seat. And uh, Janae and I, we're not, when I worked at Famous Dave's in Fargo, we, they had this little mantra of uh, C-A-Y-G-O, Kago, which was clean as you go. Yeah, Janae and I aren't those people. We're more like mess up now, clean it later, you know? And, and that's just how we live. And it's, it's great. We're all in in what we're doing. And so the car looked like people had been living in, in it for two days. And we roll up to this nice hotel and uh, we come into the little roundabout, and already alarms are going off in my head. And sure enough, the door swings open, and out walks this older gentleman in a, a suit and tie. And he walks over to our door, and I'm like, oh, no. <laughs> and he helps me open the door, and he kind of looks in and looks at me, you know. And we got up that morning, we thought, we're not going to shower, we're going on vacation. So I've got my sweats on, my hair sticking up right here. <laughs> and he kind of looks at me and looks at Janae and then looks around the car. And did everything in his power to not raise his eyebrows, you know. And, and he says, would you like me to valet your car? Now, I was like 18 before I knew what valeting was, you know. <laughs> to me, valeting was dad saying, hey, Josh, take the, car o- the tractor over to the field and I'll come pick you up. That was valet <laughs> growing up. And, uh, and I'm like, no, where I come from, I park the car. So I, I took the car down to the underground parking ramp or whatever, and we unload all our stuff, and we get up to the lobby, and everybody's dressed nice in this lobby. Even the people, there's like somebody with an iPad greeting you at the door, and, and there we are. And, uh, and everybody has all this matching luggage, and we have our 31 bag, and our diaper bag, and our dance supermarket bag, and our... <laughs> cheap TJ Maxx bag, you know. We're just like, hello everyone. We didn't know the dress code and we, we walked through the lobby and we were kind of laughing at ourselves and we get up to the room and right when we get in the door, Janae says, babe, I think we need to buy matching luggage. <laughs> what a first impression, huh? I think that was the least of our problems. But here's the reality of the simple gospel and what our church is all about. I hope nobody comes to our church and leaves and says, babe, I think we need to dress better next time we go to that church. Babe, I think, I think we better pray louder next time we go to that church. Babe, I think we better fix our lives and then maybe we can go to that church. No, I want this simple gospel kind of church where people can just come as they are. Where, you know, Jesus, he, he and his disciples row up to shore and and he's, he and the disciples, they stood before kings and they stood before uh, beggars at gates, you know, and they ministered to everyone equally. And Jesus and his disciples row up to shore and all of a sudden this demoniac, this guy filled with demons, comes running at them. And, and he's like the outcast of his society. He's been haunting his society and he comes running their direction. He's naked. He's been like, he has open wounds on his body that he's created himself. And it's like, welcome to the countryside. Here comes this demoniac running at them. And Jesus steps right up to meet the guy. If that was me I, and our pastors, I'd be like, everybody back in the boat and row. <laughs> But it didn't matter if Jesus was talking to the king or to the demoniac. He treated everybody in the same way. Why? Because here's what you and I, uh, kings, queens, and the least of these all have in common is that we have an innate spiritual need that can only be met by a relationship with Jesus. 
There is an inner gnawing and hunger that can only be met and filled by a relationship with Jesus. And some of you would say, you know what, Josh, my life is pretty good. I, I'm making good money. I have a happy family. I have a vacation home. I have this. I have that. But there is still a gnawing on the inside. That allowed Paul and Jesus and others to stand before kings and queens and to make their case about the simple gospel even to those that would have had the most power and satisfaction in society in their day. See, the problem is that you and I often will put ourselves in certain categories of who you are and who you fit in with. And then you marry somebody in that category and you hang out with people who are in that category and they make about the same money as you and they look like you and they kind of act like you. And this is the recipe of a dying, irrelevant church. A whole bunch of people that look like each other, act like each other, and only care about each other. That is not the simple gospel style of what Jesus came to do. Jesus would actually, when he got a crowd on one, in one nation or on one countryside, he would get in a boat, cross the lake, and go to a different land so that he could reach new people. So new people could be brought in. This is the model that Christ gives us. And I wonder, maybe just an easy assessment for you and I, is to say, what's the reality of your Bismarck? Is Bismarck for you a place where you're surrounded and insulated by people that look like you, act like you, and fit in with Uh, what you'll accept as a friend or a relationship? Or is Bismarck a place where you have an understanding of the fact that there's people that go to bed hungry every night, even in our community? There's people that sleep in their cars at night, even in our community. There's people that don't look like you and I, but still have basic human needs and spiritual need, just like you and I have. And I wonder what the reality is of your life if if you've given in to the tendency to insulate yourself with people like you and that agree with you, or if you allow others who have the same deep spiritual need that you do to be a part of your life. See, Jesus was an expert at this. And the amazing thing is you see moments in Scripture, back to back, where he hangs out with both kinds of people. And one of those moments is in John 3 and John 4 in the Bible, where in John 3, Jesus is hanging out and having a one-on-one conversation with Nicodemus, who is a teacher of the law, maybe a a chief saint of his community at that time. And then he goes and talks to a Samaritan woman sitting at a well who is probably the chief sinner of her community. And Jesus took the simple gospel to both places and to both groups of people. And let's talk about this and uncover what the true heart of the simple gospel is. Here's the, the, the the interaction that Jesus has with the Samaritan woman. He's traveling out of Judea, Judea to Galilee. He has to travel through Samaria. He passes through a town called Sychar. He arrives at a, a water well at about noon. He's tired and he's hungry and he's thirsty. His disciples go into town to buy food. Jesus sits down at a well. He looks over and there's a Samaritan woman drawing water by herself from the well. And Jesus said, will you give me a drink? The woman, a little bit caught off guard, looks at Jesus and says, why do you think that you can ask me for a drink? The reason she asks is because in that day, Jews did not associate with Samaritans, much less a Jewish man associating with a Samaritan woman. And if you and I were, if if you knew this woman's reputation and you saw Jesus sitting and talking with her, you'd wonder about his reputation. But Jesus chooses to engage a conversation with this woman that is far outside of his category. It's far outside of maybe the normal people that we would expect Jesus to interact with or much more expect us to interact with. Instead of answering her question, Jesus transitions the conversation into talking about her her basic spiritual need to know God and be known by God. He doesn't doesn't talk about all the outward things that she wants to get distracted by, that she's a Samaritan and and, and he's a Jew and she's a Gentile. He He doesn't get into those things. He cuts right to the heart of the matter, and oh, that God would give you and I eyes to see people's spiritual condition rather than just their outward appearance. Because God's not looking at the outward appearance. He's looking at the heart. And if we become people that will look at the heart of one another, if you'll look at the heart of your spouse, if you'll look at the, the heart of the people in your community, you will love and appreciate them more than just measuring how you and I have been indoctrinated to measure by just looking at the outward appearance. 
by thinking that a desirable or fulfilling relationship will come out of somebody who looks a certain way or acts a certain way. No, it is, after all, a matter of the heart. So Jesus transitions the conversation to talking about a spiritual matter or spiritual water, the, the way that the woman can erase the gnawing feeling of emptiness that has driven her the direction that her life has gone. And he says, you know, if you knew who you were talking to, you would have asked for living water. You wouldn't be talking about physical water. You would ask me about spiritual water. The woman doesn't really understand, she doesn't get it, what Jesus is talking about. So she asks the, the question about physical water again, and, and she says, well, what are you going to draw water with? Isn't that what you and I do? We have a deep spiritual need. We have a spiritual condition in the depths of our soul. We have a a need for spiritual security to be answered through salvation in Christ. And we always try to fulfill it with the physical. We have this gnawing feeling. And so so we we look for the next relationship or we try to find... uh, something that will work out better, or we, we look for the next person that's going to fulfill us, or we try to make more money, or we, we, and we go, I'm going to get rid of this gnawing feeling through the physical, 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 and Jesus is over here saying, I have a spiritual answer. And he's trying to say this to this woman right now, he's saying, I have a spiritual kind of water, and she's saying, physical water, physical water, physical water. And he's trying to move her in this conversation. He says, those who drink physical water will thirst again, but those who drink the water I give won't. That water will become a well springing up to eternal life. If you fill the need spiritually, it will carry you not just through this life, but even through into the next life. She still doesn't get it. And she says, well, give me that water so I don't got to keep coming back to this well. (laughs) Physical, physical need, physical need. I have a spiritual answer. Jesus then transitions the conversation away from the analogy about water, and he says, well, she's not getting it, so I'm going to actually give her spiritual water for a moment. And he uses something that we would call a spiritual gift. You can read about him in Corinthians, uh, that the Spirit of God works in us to help reach people. It's the cheat codes for uh, the simple gospel. (laughs) And Jesus has something called the word of knowledge where the Spirit tells him something about the woman's life and he shares it with her and it's part of her transformation. So he says, go and call your husband. And she says, I don't have a husband. And he said, you're right, you've had five. And the guy you're with now is not your husband. And Scripture doesn't say it, but then I think the woman peed a little. I would have. (laughs) I hope you're not offended, but we enjoy church. We don't endure it here, so... So he has a... He moves it to a... He has this word of knowledge, and he he says, you've had five husbands, and, and the woman all of a sudden realizes, oh, this guy is a spiritual guy. She starts to get it. Oh, he's not talking about physical water. And she goes, I get it. You're a prophet. You're a guy who hears from God and speaks to people. And then she tries to get on his level spiritually and she says, I know that when the Messiah called Christ comes, that he, when he comes, he'll explain everything to us. And then Jesus does something rare and almost unprecedented in Scripture. Something that he does not do with Nicodemus. He looks at the woman and he says, I who am speaking to you, I am he. And he reveals himself as the Christ to the chief sinner. So if we took a comparison and, you know, we we ranked all our sin in the room, whoever has the dirtiest plate, you know, you probably want to hide it, but you should probably just give it to Jesus because he wants to use you most. He wants to reveal him to you first, himself to you, because his grace can thrive where sin has abounded in your life. He can give you spiritual water where maybe there's been dryness or brokenness in your life before. 
See, the Samaritan woman would have been classified as outside of the reach of Jesus because of her gender, because of her heritage. Somebody disqualified from the conversation. She had a bad reputation. She went to the well on her own every day because she had been ostracized from her society. Later, the disciples themselves couldn't even believe Jesus was talking to her. But Jesus didn't walk around looking at the stereotypes. He didn't walk around looking at the categories. He walked around looking at the spiritual need. And that's why he was able to treat every person the same. Because he, he had eyes fixed on doing his Father's will, and that was meeting the spiritual need of mankind. And you know how he did it? And here's how you can do it. When you're reaching maybe across the aisle to somebody who's not like you, to somebody who doesn't look like you or act like you, or somebody that has a messed up life, and you can see that they have a spiritual need. He talked to her. He just had a conversation with her. It's worth saying that he didn't talk at her. And he didn't talk about her. He talked to her. And so many people's lives will be changed if you and I just become approachable. Even to the least of these, even to those that don't look like you and I look or act like you and I look, if, if we just become conversational. And we just open up a dialogue without so quickly being offended when somebody doesn't fall into the categories of righteous or, or, or perfect like you and I would the standard that sometimes we can create. The secret really is just to engaging somebody in a conversation. See, we, we flip back a page in the Bible into, into John 3, and we meet a man named Nicodemus who is uh, the total opposite of the Samaritan woman. He was a teacher of the law. And so the Old Testament is, is the law of how to have relationship with the Heavenly Father. And Jesus comes saying, I'm bringing a New Testament or a new covenant that your relationship with the Father no longer comes by, by following the law. Now your relationship comes through grace. It comes through my shed blood. It comes through the Son of God and the Son of Man. This is why Jesus is so important in our theology and in our understanding of who God is. And a teacher of the law comes to Jesus, and, and listen, he calls him rabbi. So he looks at Jesus and he says, I know you do many miracles, obviously God's with you. And he says, teacher, tell me about eternal life. Tell me, tell me about how God is with you. Tell me about how to have a relationship with the Father. This is the guy who taught how to have a relationship with the Father. Based on the Old Testament. See, Jesus didn't talk to Nicodemus the way that he talked to the Samaritan woman. Jesus had to teach the saint. And that means that the more that you and I have developed a worldview around what religion is or a worldview around what Jesus is or we become indoctrinated with the rules that you have to follow, that there are moments where Jesus has to teach us to unlearn what we thought we knew. See, because some of us were raised in the Lutheran church, and, and we thought that there was all these standards that we had to follow, the things that we had to do to have a relationship with God. Some of us were raised in the Catholic church, and we thought there was all these things we had to do, and you're, you're bothered that we don't take communion every week at times. Because there's things that you had to do. Some of you have been raised at evangel. And there's been things that you thought that you had to do. Or that you subconsciously did these rules, these unwritten religious duties that you had to do in order to have a relationship with the Father. Some of you, you took on mom and dad's view. You took on mom and dad's church. And you thought that's what you needed to have a relationship with the Father again. Listen, you don't have to follow the religious protocol of another church or mom and dad's church or or anybody else's church, you need to have a relationship with Jesus that will create a relational protocol that will guard and guide your life. You don't need somebody else to tell you what your behavior should look like as a Christian. You need Christ to impact your heart, be speaking to you through his spirit and his word, and he will teach you how to live in a way that guards and guides your life. But too many times in history, the church has gotten into telling people what it looks like to follow Jesus and these behaviors and these legalistic rules that we have to follow, and Christ didn't do that. In fact, I think there's a lot of issues in Scripture that he kept open-handed. He didn't give us a, a perfect, clear answer on because he wanted us to find the answer when he transformed our heart, rather than just reading it. It comes through knowing him and being in a relationship with him. See, Nicodemus struggled with this because he was a learned person. He had logic and rationale that he had to navigate. 
He, he was a, a teacher of the law who followed a set of protocols that gave him permission to have a relationship with the Father. But Jesus taught a new covenant that said, forget the protocol, have a true relationship with, with me and with the Father, and that will give you permission to live free. It's a totally different paradigm, this shift that happens between the Old Testament and the New Testament. The Old Covenant and the New Covenant, the Covenant of Law and the Covenant of Grace. And it's why you read the Old Testament and you think, what in the world? Who is this God? But it transitioned and it changed. Listen, Janae and I have a great relationship, a great marriage, and, and it's, it's thriving and it's pure and we honor and respect each other within it. But it's not because Janae's given me five rules that I'm not allowed to break. If you're going to be a part of this marriage married to me, here's what you better know. <laughs> no, it thrives and has trust and respect because I love her heart and she loves my heart and we have a relationship so we work to protect each other. And that's what Christ has called you and I to, to know his heart and for him to know your heart and then to make decisions based on that knowledge of your relationship. Not just following a set of rules. That takes the life out of everything. In fact, John 3, 17, which is, is right after one of the most well-known verses, John 3, 16, Jesus says, I, I didn't, John says, Jesus didn't come to condemn the world, but to save the world. The Son of Man did not come to make rules or to condemn or to make you feel badly about your life. He came to save you. See, the gospel will disrupt your religion because it is a gospel of grace meant to save the world. It is not a gospel of law meant to condemn the world. And we have a generation of people today that struggle with the church because the church has been legalistic in the last 30 or 40 years. And they don't want anything to do with it. And yes, there are still standards that we live our lives according to, and we we find those in Scripture and in seeking the heart of Christ. But really, if you want to reach the next generation, if you want to reach the kids or the grandkids in your family, teach them about a gospel of grace. Teach them about a gospel that sets them free, teaches them the Father's heart, and then instructs them how to live life in a way that is full and right and inherits eternal life. It will appeal to the people maybe that are, are younger than you or, or maybe you were, you were raised in that kind of a legalistic church and you just need God to help you unlearn what you thought you knew. Why is it so important? Because look what happens to the Samaritan woman. She goes from this relationship with Jesus and, and John 4, 39 and 41 say, Many Samaritans from that town believed in Christ because of her story, because of her testimony. Because she walked into town as the woman with five, hus- five and a half husbands, <laughs> the chief sinner, and everybody could see the transformation. Come on, if you have a story of what Christ has done in your life, you don't got to hide it. You don't got to wait seven years before you share it. If anyone is in Christ, they are a brand new creation. The old has gone. The new has come. Come on, there's a real sinner in your life that's trying to serve Jesus. They're trying to make the right decisions. Don't you dare hold their past mistakes over their head. Well, you know, but you were an alcoholic. You know, but you always make that decision. You've always been that way. Shame on you. You don't speak that. You speak into the heart of who they're becoming. You you speak into the heart of who Christ has made them to be. Man, this is why it's so good to be a sinner. (laughs) Former. (laughs) But to know what I was without Christ and to know what I'm becoming with him. To know who he's creating me into. This woman shared her story and was a catalyst for her entire community to experience the simple gospel. You know what I love most about the story? The people around her that used to judge her and ostracize her, they come to her now and they say, we believe like you believe and it's not just because of what you've told us, we've experienced him ourselves. I hope that's you. I hope that you don't just come to church and believe because the people around you believe. But I hope that you can say, I believe and I follow Jesus because I've experienced him. Somebody shared it once about Peter stepping out of the boat. And we always talk about Peter and his his doubt. And he steps out and he walks on the water and he begins to sink right in front of Jesus. Like, how embarrassing. He's doubting. But the reality is, there were 12 other guys that were still in the boat that didn't even step on the water. And Peter had the experience. 
because he stepped out and he trusted Christ. Even, even Nicodemus, it tells us that after Jesus is crucified, Joseph of, of Arimathea asked Pilate for the body of Jesus before he's laid in the tomb and resurrected from the dead. Joseph was a disciple of Jesus, but secretly because he feared the Jewish leaders. With Pilate's permission, he came and took the body away. He was accompanied by Nicodemus, the man who earlier had visited Jesus at night. Oh, come on, there's somebody in this place, and you've been in church a long time, or you've been religious a long time, and you need a Nicodemus-type transformation. Where it was about the rules and about just doing church, or yeah, I'm a Christian, but not really having a heart transformation to being so moved by the gospel and so impacted by Christ that you're the one that is ministering for him. Nicodemus literally comes and wraps cloths around Jesus' body and prepares him for the resurrection. What a transformation had taken in place in this guy who used to think the law was the answer and now he realizes that this guy who just died on a cross before he was even raised back to life. He was the Son of God. He did bring a new covenant of grace. Come on, if you're, if you're here today and you've been the chief sinner, the enemy will lie to you and say, because of your past, you've lost everything, any influence that you could have, any way that God could use you. But because of Christ, you just say right back, no, because of Christ... I have gained everything and I have nothing to lose. The old is gone, the new has come. If you've been living under condemnation, that's not from Christ. He came to set you free from that. If anyone is in Christ, they're a brand new creation. There is no condemnation for those that are in Christ Jesus, the Bible tells us. Maybe you're the chief saint and you've been hiding under the veneer. You've been, and it's easy when you're in earthly code, right? We're great at putting on the face and not really showing what's going on in our heart, just knowing people kind of at a surface level, holding people a little bit at bay. But inside, you know there's still a gnawing and you need a new heart transformation. You need to actually know Christ in a relationship with him. And the Bible says, just invite him over. Just invite him over. He's not too busy. He doesn't have other lunch plans. He wants to come and to dine and to be with you. Will you just close your eyes for a moment? If you're here in this place and you would say, I need to make that invitation. I need to respond to Christ's invitation. I don't have a relationship with Jesus. I've been doing the saintly thing, but I haven't had a heart transformation or I had it and I walked away from it and I feel like my love for him has grown cold. If that's you, will you lift a hand with me wherever you are? Several hands going up all over the room. Anybody else? Come on, if that's you, just pray in your heart like this. Father, come be the king of my heart. I surrender my own, my own way, God. I, I turn from what I used to be and what I used to be doing, God, and I ask that you would come and fill me with your spirit. God, that you would lead and guide me. God, that you would take my story and make it a testimony. And then many people would be changed because of it. Maybe you're here and you're a a saint today. And I would just tell you, all you're called to do now is go finish the work. Actually live it out. Let the transformation in your heart be a catalyst to see people change. Don't worry about living according to the religious protocol, but live out of the relational protocol of knowing Christ. Will you stand with me? We're going to have prayer team members up here in just a moment. They'll pray with you about any need that you might have. But I just want to close with this. In the beginning of the year, in 2017, I shared a verse and I said, this is going to be our vision for our church for 2017. And ironically, today, it's the verses at the very end of the story of the Samaritan woman. And the interesting thing is that both the Samaritan woman and Jesus came to the well for water and walked away satisfied without having a drink. Jesus came to the well hungry. His disciples came and brought him food and he said, I already have my nourishment. And they said, did somebody else feed him? They were mistaking the physical for the spiritual. 
And Jesus said this, he said, my nourishment comes from doing the will of God who sent me and from finishing his work. True satisfaction in life does not come through fulfilling the physical needs that you have. True satisfaction comes by fulfilling the spiritual need and call that God has put on the life of everyone who believes in him. To go and reach people for Jesus. To be saved by Christ, to be transformed and sanctified so you begin to look like Christ in how you live, and then to go and tell people about Christ. That is satisfaction for the human life. If you've been searching, there it is. If you've been trying to invest it in physical things, good luck. There's no U-Haul that I've seen attached to a hearse. It's going to die with you. But there is an investment that we can make that will store up treasures in heaven, and it's about telling people about what Christ has done in our lives. And maybe you're thinking, Josh, I don't really know how to do that. I love what Carson said last week when he was speaking here. He said, I was out of practice, and I was stretching, and a guy leaned over to me and said, hey, man, you read your Bible? And one question led to the transformation of a young man that you and I now know and love. And you never know what just one question, just one conversation will do for somebody who's either been struggling in their sin or struggling in their legalism. And Jesus said, you are the light of the world. You're a city on a hill. You're an ambassador for Christ Jesus. You are the fragrance of Christ to all who are perishing. So just go be it. Don't try so hard. Don't try to fit all the rules. Just go love somebody and talk to them. Even if they don't fit into the category of your life. Father, we commit this message to you in our hearts and in our lives. God, help us to live it out. God, don't let us come back next week God, without talking to somebody about this simple gospel of Jesus and what it has meant to our lives. God, we are your people. We are your soldiers. God, we are enslaved to your work on the earth. So let us do it and be effective in it. In Jesus' name, amen. Last thing. Don't come back next week without taking the opportunity that Christ is going to give you to share with somebody else because you don't know if you have next week. You don't know the next Sunday is gonna be here. I was watching a tennis player on TV this week and he lost in the first round of Wimbledon. What many, many other tennis players strive and pastors at Evangel would have strived to have been able to do. (laughs) And he said, I don't know, I was kind of bored. I've got another 10 years to play tennis. I thought, brother, you could blow out your knee tomorrow and it could all be over. And friend, you could pass away tomorrow. Jesus could return on Tuesday and it could be all over. And I want to go to heaven with no regret of who I should have told, who God gave me an opportunity to reach. And so there's somebody in your life that needs to hear and I believe God's going to give you the boldness to do it. It's why you're here on the earth sucking oxygen because he wants you to be his ambassador. Amen? Amen. Amen. Hey, we love you so, so much and are grateful that we get to do life with you and do church together and grow in Christ together. We have prayer team members available. Uh, If you're not going to come forward for prayer, go. Have a great week. God bless you. Hope to see you back next weekend. We're so glad you joined us today. Our hope is that you're challenged and encouraged by these teachings every week. We'd love to hear how God is using this ministry to change lives. Send us an email at mystory@goevangel.org. For more information about our church, check us out online at goevangel.org.